Uh, too far off the uh, 10 minutes and I would like to say first minister that I'm the person proposing this legislation and I understand it perfectly and I won't have you using comments of some people who spoke in, in favour of this legislation to undermine what is a perfectly valid and legally sound piece of legislation that we're putting forward here. Now, the first time I introduced legislation in terms of dealing with some of these issues three years ago now, I got a letter from a Church of Ireland bishop in, in uh, Tipperary and he congratulated me for taking the stand and talked about being sick of the systemic spinelessness of the political establishment and it just really came back to me as I listened to the debate here today. I think it sums up where we are because there hasn't been a single credible argument put forward against this bill. In actual fact, what we have heard is very graphic testimony of why it's needed, most particularly articulated by Deputy Boyd Barrett. I'm struck by the comments of the people in the terminations for medical reasons in the briefing that they gave on Wednesday, when they talked on one occasion in a 10-day period receiving contact from 10 families who were struck by this enormous tragedy. So this is real people, real lives, real families, while we sit and talk and don't act in here. Now, this is an incredibly limited bill, and I think it was wrong of the Minister to you know, talk about being pro-life and not supporting abortion on demand and all this sort of thing. Well, I'm pro-choice. I recognise Ireland's abortion reality. I recognise the fact that the so-called Eighth Amendment ban didn't ban abortion. It just meant that Irish abortion happened in England or Holland or with a few pills over the internet. And I support all circumstances in which a woman might uh, choose to have an abortion. That's not what this discussion is about. This is a very specific piece of legislation, very limited circumstances, where we're dealing with a foetus which is not compatible with life. Now, parts of this discussion have had the most abstract twilight zone um, aura about them. I, I, mean, I find it absolutely mad. A couple of weeks ago, we were in here where we had tabled a proposal to repeal the Eighth Amendment, and the people who voted against that proposal are now using the fact that the Constitution hasn't been repealed, and that this is too much of a limited provision, and we need to repeal the Eighth Amendment. The complete opposite of what they were arguing the last time when we tabled, and it just isn't good enough. We're dealing with narrow circumstances, a fatal, fetal abnormality. And you're absolutely correct, Minister, that misdiagnoses are possible. Of course they are. That's why the families in these situations get two, three, four, five tests. And it's not going to be the case that a foetus which doesn't have a skull or doesn't have a brain is going to go on to be a championship footballer. The parents would will it to be so, but it's not going to happen. And that is the nub of this. And the definition of being born alive has been discussed in the courts. It's not true to say that Article 33, uh, 43 3 only deals with circumstances where there's a threat to the life of the woman. That's not accurate. The PP versus HSE case that was dealt with in the courts before Christmas said that it also dealt with the right to life of the unborn and that the state had an obligation to defend that as far as is practicable. And being practicable is not the same as being possible. That has been the decision on a whole number of cases and the, what the court specifically said, that it should not be a case that uh, insisting someone should continue uh, uh, a pregnancy if it was an exercise in futility uh, and these are, the, these are the, the words of the Supreme Courts now. I didn't say go to the courts, send people off to the courts to be, have their private lives debated by barristers and all the rest of it. What I said was is people who believe and are putting forward the argument that it's unconstitutional are wrong. You don't know whether it's unconstitutional or not. The only way it can be determined whether something is constitutional or not is if our High Court or our Supreme Court adjudicate it and deem it to be so. 
That's the reality. So what you're actually saying is the present Attorney General believes it to be unconstitutional. Now, many other people believe that she is wrong, including the previous Attorney General. Other previous Attorney Generals were proven wrong. In the, as I mentioned, in the, uh, they, they was the Attorney General who took the case against Miss X and lost, as it were. So the reality is, is we don't know whether it is or not. And there is a provision if the government believes in a piece of law, to refer it under Article 26 to the President and the Council of State to have it adjudicated upon. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't think there is. I'm sick listening to this thing about unconstitutionality as if it meant, oh, that's it, pack up our bags, we can't do anything here. Declarations of unconstitutionality are regularly pleaded in judicial reviews. What happens? Does the world cave in? Does society stop moving? Section 29 of the Offences Against the State Act, the cases of Gardaí uh, being allowed to issue search warrants in their own uh, investigations, was deemed unconstitutional in 2012. Did the world stop moving? Was there a national crisis provoked? No, the law just stopped uh, and uh, they, they couldn't do that anymore. So as Deputy Wallace says, if we're right, then we have a chance of alleviating the pressure and the heartache being experienced by people today, yesterday, last week, next week. If we're wrong, well, we'll be where we are now, a situation where people in this situation can't have an avail of a termination. But unless we get to that stage, we cannot say that. And I am really sick of it in many ways. I mean, I have a litany of contributions here. As I said, over 50 Dáil deputies are on the record of this. Tánaiste, John Burton, July 2013, talking about that uh, uh, fatal fetal abnormalities for, um, for people who want, want to terminate. Her personal belief that these people should be enabled to do so here in Ireland. She'd like to believe that we as legislators would be able to reach a position at some not too distant point in the future where we can provide for this. Former Minister Alan Shatter, on a personal level, he believes it's a terrible cruelty to require a woman to carry a child who has a fatal fetal abnormality to full term. Your, yourself, Minister, your, your own records. Minister Francis Fitzgerald talking about the twilight zone that families are left in here. Minister Jared Nash, Aidan O'Reardon, Kathleen Lynch. I mean, practically most of the Cabinet here are on record. What have you done on it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I am frankly sick of every time we raise things here just being told it can't be done. If you were really serious, what have ye done then if you really feel that you're on the sides? Because those statements were made by people in here three years ago, two years ago, two and a half years ago. And to me, it is an affront that 15 Labour TDs are on record. They published an open letter to Minister James Riley where they articulated many of the views that we have articulated here and yet we face the prospect of them coming in here on Tuesday and voting against this legislation. I really hope that that does not happen. I, the Sinn Féin position, it's very regrettable that Sinn Féin didn't have this on their party conference last year or the year before but, uh, uh, on this because then they could have come around on uh, this position. But Labour and Fine Gael, my God, in the controversial Eighth Amendment, there was no whip imposed. Deputies from Fine Gael and Labour were given a free vote on the controversial Eighth Amendment uh, legislation in this House, and you won't consider doing it on something like this, which I'd say is causing an awful lot of uh, upset for the TDs who are going to be put in a position of voting against this. But do you know what? I really don't care for your upset because I, I, I'm more concerned about the people out there whose lives are being impacted by our lack of action on this. Deputy Boyd Barrett made the point correctly that you can't control nature, and we can't. We're dealing with life's tragedies here. We, we can't undo the damage, but we can at least try and alleviate some of the problems. I mean, grief and loss, sadly, are an everyday part of life for people. Bereavement is always difficult, but what else would a civilised society do but try and rally round, support people, alleviate that burden uh, as much as possible? And, you know, I, I don't know how often 
people are expected to listen to platitudes in here from TDs. They really aren't interested in it. It is long overdue. We need action. We need the government now to go between now and Friday. Go back, look at this and say, really what would be wrong with passing this legislation? Nothing. And it, it, there would be everything right about it. It would give relief to people who are in this situation now. It would be a certain lifting of the burden that people have been put under, the stigma, the heartache, and the violation of our international human rights. It's just not good enough. People don't want excuses. They want action. And I really hope that you'll think strongly before Tuesday.